Today I'm going to be discussing metabolism. This was an architectural movement that had its heyday from the late 1950s through the late 1970s. Uh, so the fundamental principles involve harmony with nature. Uh, this uh, came into, into popular culture following World War II, and, uh, which was a time of great destruction, especially for Japan, who saw the nuclear bombs dropped and the destruction that that caused and how it completely obliterated the landscape. It also has connections uh, deeper with Japanese culture and spirituality in, uh, in roots that have to do with connection with nature and humanity. Uh, the architectural style is also forward-thinking. Um, some of the things that we'll look at today, such as the, the marine city, deal with crises, such as housing crises and potential ocean levels rising, affecting the viability of large amounts of people to live in urban areas. And these are also spatially conscious units, for the most part, at least in the ideals. Um, they are what the modern person would refer to as a tiny home. The buildings also share a lot of uh, similarities with biology, as they're designed to be regeneratable and adaptable as new technologies emerge. Uh, they're also designed to have structures that come from biology, such as uh, cell-like structures that are actually able to grow and extend as needs are suited. The metabolist philosophy also encourages um, environmental awareness because of how it uses these biological structures. And it also prepares for innovation. And by making things adaptable and regeneratable, they can be updated with new technology by the time that they're ready for renovation. But the idea of fabrication off-site is really what makes this possible. And it's able to be done for cheap. Off-site fabrication also allows units to be locally sourced, and it makes the installation of units much easier because you can do it from the exterior instead of having to bring, say, a new refrigerator like into the building through the elevator into the unit. You can just load it all in at the same time. The Metabolist Movement really took hold at the World Design Conference in Tokyo in 1960. The primary artist and architect was Kenzo Tange, uh, but also on the slide I list four other names if you're looking for uh, deeper places to dig. And so it was at this conference where designs were presented that this group really achieved Starchitect status, uh, partly because of the ideals that their work had, uh, but these ideals led to actual commissions being realized. Uh, at, also at this design conference they published the Metabolist Manifesto which really laid out their fundamentals. And also presented was Kenzo Tange's Vision for Tokyo. So as you can see on this map here, on the right, there is this small highway that goes across the Tokyo Bay. And on the left is uh, Kenzo's vision for a way to expand the urban space in a way that's more linear than concentric. And it would also be a way to expand the land mass available, which would ultimately make housing more affordable and be able to support more people in the same area. Buildings on water is kind of a common theme in the metabolist movement, and that's what I explore in this presentation mostly. Uh, so I kind of compare the paper architecture, which I am very interested in, to the actual realizations of such ideals. And so for the paper architecture, in addition to uh, Kenzo Tange's vision for Tokyo, we have the Marine City. And this was designed from 1958 to 1963. And there are three phases. Each one kind of coexists and builds on the previous one. But the things that all three phases share in common is they float on water, and they're designed to be self-sufficient. Um, they exist as an extension of land. And they're all concentric structures with a central control unit, industry around the outside that kind of represents the cell wall in the nature metaphor. And the dwellings where the people live function as uh, sort of the organelles and the the actual makeup of the cell. They're also designed in a way where they can grow and expand and additions can be made to them. So our first design here for Marine City Project from 1958 is a pretty loose sketch but you can kind of see the core principles starting to develop on this project. So we have around the outside here is a line of buoys and then on the next layer these towers that go under the ocean are the industrial facilities 
as you can see from this diagram on the right, the production facilities as they're labeled there. And so the way that these work is there's the stem that goes down in the center that has all the utilities. And coming off of that stem, there are capsules, which are one of the main features of metabolist architecture. They are all about capsules, as you saw in the title slide. Uh, but within this ring of production facilities, there is the dwelling facilities. And you can see on this diagram how it kind of is starting to look like a cell. And in the center is the nucleus, the control facility, where kind of everything, all the activity on the island is dictated. In the 1958 model, the scale of this drawing here is there are six living towers that each hold 58,000 people and 12 industrial facilities on the outside. So this is designed to be a self-sustaining structure. 50,000 is a lot of people to sort of inhabit one of these floating cities. And the feasibility of getting everything manufactured that they can and this outer ring is questionable. but. Uh, the detail is not really dived into in the proposal here. It's more so an idea that hasn't really grown. Uh, but it does continue to develop onto 1960 when the Marine City Unabara project is presented. And this is presumably presented at the 1960 Tokyo Design Conference. Uh, but for changes here, we can see development further of the outer ring, uh, which is these floating sheet platforms held up by by buoys and plastic foam. And these are also connected around the outside with this pipe style road. And it presumably allows for some flexibility in the water. So this is not really a rigid shape. Uh, the inner layer has these houses with hyperbolic parabola shaped fins or sails. Uh, these are structured a lot like Fox Hall actually in the sense that there's a tower that goes up in the center and there are three fins that come off each with housing units. And at the base of these, there are city plazas. And because it's compact living, it's sort of designed so that way you spend minimal amount of time inside of your actual living quarters and more time in public spaces, either outdoor or indoor. And it's kind of like a, a socialist dream in this rendering. Uh, other of their floating cities designs are more so made to expand on the actual city and not be self-sufficient. And so we'll see that a little bit later. Uh, also in this design, we can see the cell-like structure. And so as the civilization expands, it's designed to be able to bring in more components and eventually split into a second society. And so they can coexist out on the ocean. This also unveils, uh, number four here is a 500 meter storm barrier to prevent that from washing away important assets in this city. So the outer production zone and the inner housing zone are separated by ocean where marine products can be grown. So this is presumably a place for a food source. For the control towers in the middle to balance buoyancy and gravity, one would extend 500 meters above the ocean and one would extend 1,000 meters below. The plans also describe an energy center at these control towers with an artificial sun on the top of it. So this is presumably a way to harness solar power. Uh, it's not really made very clear. But the second design does certainly expand on the first, uh, either with replacement ideas or ideas that could be used in tandem, depending on the context. The 1963 Marine City design called Mother City takes a similar approach to the Unabara project from 1960 but the structure is slightly different. So instead of a concentric ring of a single dwelling, like one, one layer of dwelling around the core and the production zone on the outside, uh, we have clusters of dwellings that each, each cluster relates to one of the production zone islands. And the fluid structure here is more, more evident like how in a cell, things can move around the cell freely. They're not constricted to one place. And on this diagram on the right, you can further see how this is designed to um, expand like a cell and be able to duplicate itself depending on the needs of the population. Thus far, we've really only dealt with paper architecture that came from the metabolist movement. But in 1975, we actually do see a realization of the marine city and it is very lackluster. 
Uh, this was part of the 1975 Expo called the Okinawa Marine Exposition, and it showcased science, technology, and biology in the ocean in this region. And so you can see this sort of floating platform here with the, the vertical shafts that descend under the ocean. But it's kind of sad because this utopian dream is really rendered here only as a tourist attraction. And it was disassembled shortly after being put up. To continue with this theme of structures from the metabolist movement being deconstructed, we also have the 1970 Osaka World's Fair and the Nakajin Capsule Tower. So the World's Fair, this was the first one held in Japan or Asia, and it showcased their, their capsule-like structure ideas and pretty much reiterated what was published in the 1960 manifesto, but more to a, a popular audience. And in this bottom image here, we can see a restaurant sort of pavilion. Uh, but the World Fair is more of a showcase of ideas, and it wasn't really meant to be permanent. But on the right here, we have this capsule tower that was built in 1972. And this was designed to be permanent, but with it have a permanent core and replaceable pods that could be adaptable to technology. And in the bottom right here, you can see these pods being fabricated off-site. Uh, but this was also disassembled just last year in 2022. Uh, so... Perhaps this might apply to more of a vision where the metabolists could build a whole city. And we can sort of see a design for that in the top right here, like a capsule city. But it could include high-rises like this in a different context. But the idea of prefabrication and being able to make all the units the same and just fit them like puzzle pieces is very interesting. And uh, it could really make design more efficient and sustainable. I actually watched a video one time about a city built in China that was a complete replica of Paris. So it's kind of fun to imagine what that funding would have done if it was given to metabolists to sort of design their own city. Because uh, the, the replica of Paris in the video I said was uninhabited. But I'd like to move on here and just give briefly a survey of some of the more practical realizations of metabolist buildings. So in the top left here we see a factory, the Nitto Food Cannery from 1964, and you can see the metabolist principle of designed expansion uh, as these, these posts on the outside on the corner have fittings for the warehouse to be made larger. Uh, moving over to the right here, we have the Kyoto building from 1974 that is actually uh, stacked capsules on top of each other. So each floor was prefabricated and moved in stack to form this office building. Uh, moving again to the right, we have the capsule house, which connects with the last slide with the, the capsule village and the prefabrication leading to better efficiency. And as, as someone who is interested in, in public spaces for entertainment, I was kind of taken by this discotech space capsule. It's like a, a bar venue, just reinforcing the metabolist style and aesthetic. It's also kind of cool in this one to see what kind of design ideas they had for interiors rather than just exteriors. It is a uh, very retro futuristic I guess. And in the bottom right here we have a resort town which is ironically also designed for expansion. You could put multiple resorts linked right into each other to look like cells. And this more so feels like a novelty relating to the style than something that would actually be functional. But a lot of this is more so about art than it is complete utilitarianism. So to conclude here, the legacy of the metabolist ideas is kind of mixed because their ideas did foreshadow what we'd have with global warming and ocean levels rising So there, and urban housing crises too and affordable living. So their ideas actually move in the direction of solutions to a lot of these new problems that we're facing that were sort of just beginning to show in the 60s and 70s when this movement began. Uh, it's also conducive to people who want to live a simple lifestyle, as many people in the tiny home uh, market are doing today. But this sort of lends itself more to an entire city of these style of homes that would be, uh, they just use a little and they're designed to be efficient. Another thing I'd like to mention really quick is Kurokawa's manifesto. It was one of the artists I mentioned on the second or third slide. 
Uh, this manifesto is a graphically designed book that shows off a lot of the progress of metabolism since its conception, and I'm a really big fan of the aesthetic, personally. Though many of the metabolist structures were never even built, they remained on paper, and a lot of them have been disassembled. They really laid the framework for solutions to problems that have not yet arisen, so it was very forward-thinking architecture.